Und zurück bei Fast Forward und hier sitzen jetzt die Pesh Mode bei mir in der Sendung. Welcome, gentlemen, from my Hello. show. I'm very Thank proud you. to have you here. Yeah. Um, of course, we have to talk about the new album, Exciter. Um, the new album um, sort of has a really great diversity of um, sounds and especially moods. It's sort of as if every little song is like um, a, a microcosmos. You would say, would you agree to that? I think really over the last couple of records it's been more important just creating the right atmospheres because most of the songs are quite atmospheric pieces so it's been a question of, the, of layering textures. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's been really important for us. Yeah. And um, lots of people have already sort of compared Exciter to a Black Celebration. Would you agree to that comparison? Could you? Can you see parallels somehow? I think yes. this is down to me. I apologise. Yes. <laughs> Please. And, uh, <laughs> um, I think what I meant, uh, as you said earlier, the diversity, I, I, I don't think it uh, uh, sounds like Black Celebration, but it's just the, the diversity of songs, you know. Yes. It just reminded me because all the different styles and, yeah. and different vibes, that's, that's the reason. Exactly, you know? because yeah. Black Celebration was already sort of like different moves on every yeah. song you could say yeah and um, I think uh, this time the arrangements on the album were much more um, I would say subtle and, and more reduced so does, is, was that something you planned right from the beginning or did that, that sort of occur to you while working with um, with a bell well, the, With I Bell. think the, the, uh, <laughs> no, the, the um, yes. Mark. Yes, Mark, sorry, well, but yeah, okay. Yeah, we used to call him Belly. Oh, yeah. Belly, well, I wouldn't Don't say... Say hello to Belly. Yeah. Hi, Belly. Yeah. <laughs> lady boy. Yeah. Lady boy. Where are your lady boys? Uh, uh. So, so, so was it planned from the beginning to have it sort of subtle and reduced? I think that the, uh, the, the way the demos were, were yeah. finished sort of dictated that. You know, they were quite minimal. Yeah. And I think yeah, we often try and get that minimalism in the, in in our music, and and we we haven't always succeeded in the past. I think it, you know, it's it's difficult because you're left with a, a balance of vulnerability. You know, yeah, it's, you have to just get that right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it's yeah, I'm really, we're really pleased this time. Yeah. So, so is is it as I imagine that you have it sort of quite simple at first, and then you fill it up? up I think we with... did that in the old days a lot. You know? Yeah. I think for once on this album we've managed to achieve like minimalism and without the song sounding empty. Yeah, okay, and, and this goes to Dave. Um, I, I have this feeling that, that your voice has a developed sort of a much deeper form. Would you sort of say that, that you got deeper into the song somehow? Um, yeah, I think so. I think yeah. that I... Um I just I feel like I'm this uh, my voice is coming from a better place yeah um, within me as well you know and um, once I stopped like Fletch said you know like sometimes you know you fall into the trap of like um, especially when you're singing it's like that's how I sing and uh, that's that's you know that that's my voice and so that's kind of the treatment I, I would like work out on every song yeah. no matter what was really going on there but for me like the mood of each song like you said was is, is very is very different yeah. and I, I realized quite early on that it was going to take sort of very different moods from me to sort of help that uh like like atmosphere to to build you know so um yeah it was challenging you know but in a really good way and i you know, I felt as well from the songs, I didn't sort of sit down and like look at the lyrics and um, try and, uh, I, ne I never try and reinterpret like what I think it is that Martin is writing about. What he could you know? mean, yeah. But, but I somehow pick up uh, uh, in the melodies and, and within the words um, uh, a feeling that I always feel like I can identify with. Actually, it's not always, but on this album I, I felt felt like that a lot and yeah. that made it a lot easier once I stopped trying. Okay, and um, we're going to watch um, the new video, Dream On, that this is going to be broadcasted when it's out. And um, that is one of these songs that I thought were very sort of reduced, sort of uh, in a pretty way simple, you know, sort of. And um, ha can you remember how this acoustic guitar part occurred to you? It's mine. Well, when I first wrote the song, it was, I started on an, on a, an acoustic guitar and wrote the words, the melody, and recorded that um, to tape. Well, it wasn't to tape, it was to hard drive these days. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then I was working with a couple of friends in the studio. The Gareth Jones is a guy we've worked a lot with in the past and on yeah. previous albums, and one of my friends, Paul Freegard, who's a keyboard programmer. 
And we wanted to take the song then off in a totally different direction. Mm -hmm. So we got all these hard electronics and really sort of minimal clicks and bleeps and things happening. Yeah. And it was only uh, sort of like three or four days into the actual working of the song that we thought, let's just put the guitar back in, just see what it sounds like. That was just supposed to be a, a rough skeleton that was going to go somewhere else. Yeah. We put it back in and suddenly it all made sense because it was such a great contrast between the electronics. Yeah, I knew there must have been a story to that guitar. <laughs> so uh, here goes Dream On for you, the first video from Depeche Mode. Und zurück bei Fast Forward mit Deepesh Mode bei mir in der Sendung hier in Hamburg. Um, so we just saw Dream On and um, for this time you didn't work with Anton Corbein together, so um, instead with Stefan Sednawi, is that right? Yes. Now, wh why did you decide to choose uh, Stefan Sednawi this time? Well, it was a process of elimination, really, and um, <laughs> we're, you know, it was suge suggested to us that we worked with, tried changing this time and working with someone different and um, I think that was a good thing um, um, from Anton to just have a break and um, we looked through lots of different show reels um, of different sort of video directors and by far um, Stefan's work you know stuck out yeah um, and, and what I like about his work is that it, in the same way Anton's photography it's like it's really uh, complements like the, the music um, rather than necessarily sort of telling some kind of story or trying to sort of uh, tell you what it's about with yeah. the visuals. And yeah. I, I don't think our, our, our music does that. Yeah. You know, I think it, it, it's left to, you know, you, you to sort of think what you want to think. And um, that goes for us too, you know. So yeah. he definitely... We haven't actually seen the video, even though you, you've just shown it and this is going to yes, go out later and, on. and we have seen uh, it. <laughs> well, we have yeah. seen it, but, you know, between you and me. Yes. Uh, uh, off the record, um, yeah. we've still yet to see the finished sort of post-production. Yeah. He does an awful lot of work, Stefan does, like after you've finished filming, he does a lot of work on his own. Um, with lots of lights and video Yes, exactly, effects and the stuff. light thing. Obviously, uh -huh. so I have mm -hmm. these light figures in yeah, it, always yeah, the light exactly. balls. And There's stuff. definitely a light figure. Yeah, light, light fetish it is, Nelly, mm -hmm. I, I would say. <laughs> yeah. um, this is a question for you, Martin. Um, you once said, this is a quote of yours, that um, your main motive for writing songs is to tap people in, in their emotions. And um, what does a good song have to have to touch your emotions? I think really it's just about um, something you can relate to for me. Yeah. Um, you know, when I write a song, I just try and capture an emotion that means something for me and hopefully it connects with somebody else out there. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully most of the time it seems to do that. You know, there are, our fans are the most obsessive in the world, so I think, um, you know, some, there's some communication thing going on. Yeah. But, but it is sort of in some way sort of writing about a special moment, maybe in your life or something that you can relate to, and then it's gone. It's like sort of a moment, and for other people, years afterwards, it means something. It's sort of really amazing, really. It's, it's, it is amazing these days. You know, you can sit in a little, you know, my little studio at home and like, work on a little idea, and then it just goes out all over the world. <coughs> it's, yeah. you know, it's just incredible, you know, especially with like, internet these days. Yeah. I mean, you can literally put, you could, if you wanted, put a demo out that day and it'd be all over the world. Mm -hmm. but, but do you, do you think about <coughs> things like that? Sort of uh, wonder how many people are going to listen to what you're doing at that second? I don't over-obsess about it, you, you know, I don't think <laughs> yeah, about who it's aimed for or anything like that. Like I said, I try and do something that interests me. Yeah. But, um, you know, there is it's such a mass communication thing through music. Yeah. And, and th this is now for you two. <coughs> when Martin comes up with the song, is it sort of, do you need time for a sort of interpretation or is it sort of mostly clear what he means, sort of now you know each other for so long? Well, I just got to really sort of copy what. Um, so I got my copy. with Martin. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I've got it out again. Sorry, I do this uh, with every TV interview now. Really? Go into a coughing attack. I think it must be nerves or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> better, better than sneezing onto people. I could do that as well. No, please don't. <laughs> don't sneeze on me. It's sort of that far. Sorry. Um, I've done it again, haven't so, I? Yeah, it's just, he does this, and then I'm like, uh, um, no. Um, I, what Martin just said, basically, you know, somehow Martin's song touches me. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm singing in that way, there's something about it. It doesn't necessarily have to be, um, but I identify 
I identify with the feeling that it gives me. Yeah. And I, you know, I can't really explain that. I don't really want to even try to. Yeah. It just happens and it, and it feels right when I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a question for you. Uh, I'd also like to add as well, oh, yes, you know, some of the, talking about Mark's songs, I think one of the nicest things about being in the group is, you know, when you do hear Martin's demos for the first time or, you know, and the other nice thing obviously is when we finish the CD and you get mm. your first the pressing of it, baby. Yeah. which is really two of the nicest things, you know. Yeah, and uh, this is also a question to you. Um, uh, what, at what a point of uh, developing a song do you sort of realise, no, this is a Dave song and this is a Martin song? Do, does it always happen before you go in the studio or does it often no. change in the studio? Not really. I mean, I think I'm, it, it's, it's on this album, you know, so Dave, Dave said he... He did, particularly didn't want to say, uh, sing comatose, not because he didn't like it, but he couldn't get a vibe on it as such. I yeah. don't know if that's the right word. Yeah. And yeah. Breve, I think, um, Mark Bell felt that, that the demo with Martin's voice on it, it suited it uh, nicely, you know. Yeah. So, and I think it's nice that, that, and it's good for Dave as well, being, although he's the singer of the band, for, to allow Martin to yeah. sing a couple of songs on the thing, because he could insist, no, I'm the singer, I'm going to sing them all. Yeah. But I think... Um, it, it makes the Depeche Mode's album uh, a bit more different and, you know, with a different uh, voice coming in. Yeah, so sort of mixing yeah. up the yeah. working areas somehow, mm. sort of yeah. not saying you are that and you are that and that stays like that forever. That's true, yeah. yeah. And, and we're going to look at an, another video, Enjoy the Silence, and I have to dedicate it to one of your greatest fans, Michael Mulva. That goes out to you. Yes. <laughs> I had to do it, otherwise he'll kill me. Und äh, zurück bei Fast Forward mit den tollen Deepesh Mode bei mir in der Sendung. Um, on the one hand, um, Deepesh Mode always created really big, great pop songs. And on the other hand, Deepesh Mode was always very experimental and had sort of great musical visions. Is that, are those two aspects that are difficult to combine for you? Or does no, it just happen? <laughs> I think we really try and push ourselves with every record. Yeah. And, you know, I think we would just give up if we felt that, you know, we were just relying on some retro past, you know, that, yeah. and we're going out playing hits that were important once, but, you know, yeah. um, and fans still love to hear them, but no one really wants to hear the new records. Yeah. So we really do try and experiment and push ourselves, but we still do make conventional pop music somehow as well. Yeah, we do combine those things. Yeah. But, but is it sort of a thing that you think about, or, or does it sort of happen just come out and i think it's you know again i think where music's lacking at the moment i mean when we started in the 80s you know although you might think a lot of it looked a lot of it looked funny and you know and everything but at least everyone was trying to be different or do something yeah. different yeah. and uh, i think there's a bit of lack of that at the moment so we always tried to be different yeah. from, it, from the next band yeah. oh, in, instead of now sort of lots of bands are trying to be exactly the same, the same like others yeah. and sort of looking better only or things like that sort of really stupid and I, I so two months ago I had the honor to interview Daniel Miller on the show and we talked about this mm -hmm. unbelievably special relationship between Depeche Mode and um, Mute Records I mean, would you say that it's sort of how, how come that this uh, relationship is so special why have you always stayed there well, I think a lot of that is to do with Daniel yeah. And a, you know, a sense of loyalty to him, and he has a, that, that that goes both ways. And uh, he's always been really supportive of whatever we want to do. Mm. You know, we, we've had our fights in the past over stuff, but basically, Daniel, you know, is one of the very few who still uh, believes in the, the ethic of, you know, independent music and alternative music and um, uh, the idea behind that. Um, so letting people be creative. Yeah, I mean, if you look at all the sort of different artists that are on mute, they're so diverse mm. and so different. Um, um, there isn't like one sort of area there where it's just like all this kind of music or all that kind of music. It's just right across the board. And, uh, you know, he comes as well, like us, from that time when, um, you know, when we grew up as teenagers, like, punk music was around and it was all about sort of trying to do it yourself in your own well, way. With cheap with, instruments with whatever you could, could afford, yeah. With whatever you could do. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think that's how Mute began as well, you know. Yeah. 
Uh, do, do you um, follow sort of the new artists on on mute, sort of like like Add N to X and Goldfrapp? And are you interested mm -hmm. in things like that? I really like the Goldfrapp records. Yeah, yeah. Are. yeah that's so that unbelievable sort of soundtrack music. When I first Daniel sent it to me and I played it, and then I I was talking to him on the phone a little afterwards, and I said, so you know, which part of Austria are they from? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, and just guessing, and yeah. he was like, actually, you know, they're not at all. And and then we started talking about the instrumentation, and again, I think. I think what's really interesting about that music, first of all, is just the beauty in her voice. Yeah. But secondly, the, the the sounds don't necessarily come from where you think they're coming from. Yeah. And you know, it, it's just that use of like, especially some of the electronics that I hear on that album that they're using in a conventional way, like through amplifiers. And apparently, they do that live a lot. They play a lot of the synthesizers and stuff, old analog synthesizers through yeah. amplifiers and stuff, and yeah. you can hear it, it's some really interesting sounds. Um, and the new Nick Cave album I really like yeah. as well, it's great. Yeah. Well, I think it's funny, I mean, I get these, uh, I get all the new releases sent through, and so I might get seven or eight. Yeah. And I think even though I don't like every one of them, I can still relate to the fact that it's at least different, yeah. you know, and, yeah. it's, and it's alternative. Yeah. To what's around on the mainstream. And, and you know. something new. Yeah, exactly. But somehow, yeah. Is it, no matter if you like it or not, it's, yeah, mm. true. The great thing about Daniel as well, is without having a whole show about Daniel Miller, <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is the fact that he still is a music fan. Yeah. You know, he's been going to Berlin once a month to, uh, to do a radio show. It's called Daniel Miller's Happy Hour. Yeah. And he plays just the weirdest stuff, the weirdest set of music that you can imagine. But somehow it works. I mean, you know that Daniel was really into all of that stuff. Yeah. I mean, he sifts through loads and loads of music just to, you know, get an hour every month. Yeah. yeah I, I sort of had the impression also sort of, uh, that he didn't really like giving interviews that much but as soon as he's allowed to sort of talk about his bands that he loves so much it's so he he's has this shiny big, and shining in his eyes it's he's got a very big ego don't worry <laughs> 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 so, okay i'm not <laughs> um, okay and um you were also sort of great pioneers in the remix culture i i would say so what, what was the idea behind it so years ago when you had songs remixed was it sort of to give artists a chance to pick out um, other aspects of a song? Uh, not really. It started off for commercial reasons, to be honest. Really? Um, yeah, well, you know, you had to release um, a, a 12 inch and things like that, and you couldn't just re repeat what you already did, you know, and then it's developed into this more interesting thing of, uh, of people we like. And, I mean, either we met these uh, guys in New York, you know, and we liked what they were doing, mm -hmm. and then we did doing it, you know. Like, doing yeah, what they're doing. Yeah. And, um, and you know, it's, and it's nice, you know, just give it a go, you know, see what you can do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, had, they had, didn't even have a record released at the time, you know, I think they, they made a copy, a few copies of an album, um, you know, just for themselves, really, and just to distribute to a few friends, and, yeah. and they, they did a remix for us. So that's, you know, that's nice. But, you know, I think, you know, it's interesting, because, again, even the re remix is what's nice, is... Like Marty might like one one of them a lot, and I might not like it, or yeah. Dave might like that one. But then you've got other ones. Do you know what I'm saying? Like. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. not that you know. Sometimes you don't like every one. Yeah. yeah. Again, these are just hate them. Then we don't put them out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that would be stupid. <laughs> the, the beauty of it is, as well, is it you know once again like with our music, I think it works well, really well in that form. Mm. You know, you could see it always gives me ideas. If anything, the, the best thing that comes out of it for me is that it shows me how different, in different directions that, are, once again, like Martin songs and, or even sometimes the things they do to my voice, even though sometimes I hate it, what they do, when it's over-processed yeah. and stuff, but, uh, or it's like, I, I, what I really hate about them is, and it's just my personal thing, is like, when it's, when it's like the song, like the actual, and, and sometimes it's just, it really is in that form, that's, you gotta, you gotta listen to it in a completely different way. That's the challenge. Mm. You know, it isn't the song anymore. Yeah. It, it's somebody else's interpretation of the song, and they're, they're adding to it and taking away the things that they don't like about it. You know, that, so... That you maybe thought were the best. You get a little precious yeah. sometimes, you know, especially when you've just finished an album and, you, you know... Okay. Yeah. But well, we'll watch the next video. It's called A Heart from Deepesh Mode. Oh my god. Oh, god. Oh, no, Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yes, well, sorry. Und zurück bei Fast Forward mit dem wundervollen Deepesh Mode bei mir in der Sendung. Um, your albums were always perfectly arranged and uh, produced. And I always wondered if you 
ever thought of sort of doing a really raw song, sort of like, you know, a one-take song? Uh, or would you say, no, that's not what Deepesh Mode is about? I think it's a show, I, I, only me personally speaking, I think we have done that a couple of times, and I think we should have done it more, I think, you know. I yeah. think the only yeah. time... Because I think it's interesting. Sorry. Yeah, it has got so, a yeah. charm about yeah. it, yeah. I think the only time we really did that was probably speak and spell, <laughs> you know, we'll, and even that, I mean, we, we're kind of not set up like that anymore, yeah. I, I haven't really ever been, you know, yeah. like, to, we, we tried it a little bit with Songs of Faith and Devotion and it was really bad, and um, most of the time when we tried to sort of, Alan got on drums and I think Mark played guitar a bit, you know, so we, more to sort of try and work out some arrangements or something, that was really Flood's idea behind it, but... It didn't quite happen, but um, I don't know. It's not uh, you know like the personal Jesus acoustic mix. That was yeah. Really I mean, good. to yeah. be honest, yeah. we come like with this album. The closest we come to that was when we did like when the body speaks, mm. when Martin was playing guitar and I was singing, and and there was there was magic in that room. It felt you could felt like it. You yeah. know, it was kind of like you know hairs on the back of the neck stuff. You know. <laughs> But we're not yeah. really a jamming band because yeah. you know I can go on guitar, and Dave can go on vocals, and we can set up a keyboard for Andy. But then that's that's it, really. Yeah. I mean, this time we had Mark Bell. I suppose we could have shoved him on something, but you know we 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 haven't got a full band lineup, so we, you know we that's why when we go out live, we need to get in a drummer and keyboard player to augment the sound. Yeah. That, that's when it becomes more of a you know more sort of looser and live thing. Yeah. One thing I have to talk about um, with you is um, your fans, and I, I would say your fans are the most loyal fans pop history has ever seen, I would say. Then what would you say? Where does this loyalty come from? They're all paid regularly every week. <laughs> yeah. So many Deutsche Marks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Did check, you like talking about it? You... Well, obviously we're very, very pleased that our fans are so loyal, and it m means we can release whatever record we like. You know? Yeah. Yeah, well, but it, it is sort of, the more you think about it, so yeah, they stay loyal all those years, you get new fans, sort of young fans, and it sort of goes on. And the more you think about this fan thing with Depeche Mode, it's sort of just like sort of a wonder, really. I think it's, it's amazing. That, I think it's something that we, you know, you know, it's not, um, it's, it, again, it's like what Martin said earlier, it's like, you know, they pick up on something that, that we do, that, you know, I don't think we can even pinpoint, you know, it's something that happens. It's something between, like, the relationship between, like, the songs and my voice and performing and uh, um, the atmospheres that we put them songs in that people, like like myself, when I'm singing them, that I, I identify with. Yeah. It, it, it touches me. Yeah. I think there's one thing that helps us, though. I think... And the fact that we don't really get radio play in a lot of countries around the world but still manage to sell records, that helps us to sustain this kind of cult thing. Mm. And it becomes a kind of religion for people. Yeah, it because it's like us against the world. It's dead, sort of. Do, do you yeah, mean that? That's what I mean, you know, played and played and played. Yeah, yeah. so it's lots of people say, yeah. oh God, I can't stand it anymore. But even though yeah. we sell a lot of records, it still feels like there's an element of rebellion in there because it's not like the accepted mainstream. Yeah. And the way our music is set up as well and the way that radio is set up is, is completely different. You know, a lot of radio stations are geared towards playing something that will instantly gratify people. They, want, they think that they, they're playing something that is going to make somebody instantly react and, mm. and uh, enjoy it or whatever. And there's no sort of, uh, unless it's like nighttime radio or whatever, there's not a lot of thought behind like something that uh, might take more than one play to actually sort of maybe get into and find a deeper feeling inside yeah. it. It's not set up like that. Even MTV, unfortunately, I think is like that as well now. Yeah. It kind of dictates uh, like this... You know, if I, when I watch MTV, like when I've just been in, in London for a bit, it's just like, it, it's just after a while, it's just like the same band rolling into the next and one. It's sort of, I have, uh, that's my impression that they go for bands that are bound to be it's successful it's, and it's, they sort of give the people exactly what they want well, and nothing I don't, more. I don't, I don't agree necessarily with it's what the people want or uh, what, what bands of, of music zombie. want. They think they're zombies so that they go out <clears> and buy it. I think, I think you, uh, you believe what you're given, unfortunately. Mm. You know, yeah. and I think you've got to search a little harder if you want to find things that might like, move you a little, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's one the good thing about, one of the good things about Napster, for instance, is this ability to be able to, to hear a band's name and then just to go online and actually... And get five and versions of it. Whatever, yeah. you know, do you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and unfortunately, the reason why Napster is such a success is because 
radio and, uh, and TV is just so mainstream, and even record shops don't stock many things that are interesting, just the top 40 or whatever, yeah, you know. Yeah. So, so this is the final question already. So, that, and what are your plans for touring Germany? Well, I've already seen the poster. Okay, come on, let's film it. Let's pause that. Huh? So yeah, we start. Yeah, we actually start touring in June mm -hmm. um, in America, and um, then we finish there towards the end of August. And I think we'll be in Germany in September, but basically all over Europe until the end of the year. Brilliant. Well. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank We're you. done. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs>